am. Thanks for reminding me because I hadn't thought about that. Okay. All right. Let me see. Uh, let's see how we can do this. What do you see with my my screen now? I don't. Not yet. Uh uh. All right. Maybe I have to hit share screen or something like that. Yeah. Let's down see. at the bottom, there's a green. Uh, there's a green icon and it yeah. says share okay. screen. Share screen. There you go. We're good. Okay. Perfect. So now I want to hit this. Okay, that looks better. Okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, Jeff. Um, um, hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be able to uh, talk with you in this type of forum. I um, I consider myself more of a student than a teacher. And actually, just listening to some of that stuff you were talking about with those cat photos, I was learning stuff already. Um, so hopefully uh, I can impart a little bit of what I know about nightscape photography, um, but it sounds like you guys know a whole lot already about photography, so that's great. I've never taken a photography course, so I might have to just enroll in Jeff's course one of these days, uh, learn some stuff. But anyway, I'm gonna talk today about Milky Way nightscape photography. Um, and by by nightscape, a nightscape is a landscape shot taken at night. And oftentimes, but not always, but oftentimes um, you can use the Milky Way as a backdrop. So that's kind of what I'm gonna focus on today is um, Milky Way nightscape photography with just a camera and tripod, nothing fancy. I've done a lot of astrophotography using various telescopes as the lens to shoot celestial objects, um, but this is, uh, this is a departure from that. And this uses very relatively simple equipment compared to what you have to do to shoot celestial objects. So um, let's get started. Here's just a couple shots just to sort of set the, set the mood. Um, this is uh, Shark Fin Cove in Santa Cruz, California, where I used to work, uh, live and work. Um, and this is the Milky Way shot through a, a natural rock tunnel at, uh, at Shark Fin Cove. Here's another shot. I currently live in Bend, Oregon. Um, uh, Central Oregon is the high desert. It's not the rainy part of Oregon. Um, and this is a shot that was actually taken in, in June uh, when there was still lots of snow around. Um, of the core of the Milky Way over Mount Bachelor. And one final shot before I kind of dig in. This is a panorama uh, where you see the entire uh, summer Milky Way arch. And this is at Mono Lake, the, some tufa uh, structures here. And this is taken just by um, taking a, a sequence of images where uh, you take a shot and then you move your camera about 20 degrees or something like that, take another shot, move your camera, take another shot. So this might be, um, you know, eight or 10 shots um, and the stitch together in, in Lightroom. It's very easy to do that. Um, and I like Milky Way panoramas. We'll see a couple more of them during the talk. So I wanted to first start out with what is the Milky Way exactly? We see it as a kind of a band in the sky if you're in a dark location, uh, a dense band of stars. And actually um, what you're looking at is um, you're looking at you're looking at the inside of our galaxy sort of looking towards the center. And if you were to look at the Milky Way galaxy, which is the galaxy in which our solar system resides, if you were to look at it sort of from above, um, it would look a lot like this particular galaxy, UGC 12158. Our galaxy is a barred spiral galaxy. And you can see this, this is a barred spiral galaxy. It's got this sort of bar in the center and then these spiral arms that, that, uh, that fit, flare out. And our solar system is sort of, you know, maybe two thirds of the way out. 
And when you're looking at the Milky Way, you're looking towards the center, towards this dense core. So here's an edge on view of the Milky Way that shows this bulge in the center, this, this core um, of the galaxy. And here's a shot taken from the Southern Hemisphere, from Chile, which shows it really nicely. Um, so you're looking at, looking toward the center of the galaxy and you can see this, this larger area, the, the core. And that area um, is sort of the really interesting part of the uh, Milky Way. And in the summertime, spring, summer, and into a little bit into fall, you can see this core uh, of the Milky Way. Um, it's visible above the horizon from where we are. So the Milky Way is visible year round, but the best part of it, the part that has the core is visible in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, March through October. And the prime viewing time is really late April through late July in the galactic center, the galactic core is visible at that time. So how do you find it? How do you find the Milky Way? Um, you know, you can go outside and if it's dark enough, you'll be able to see it pretty quickly. Um, there's also a different age you can use. A simple planisphere, which is a star wheel that has a, a disc that, that rotates and a, and a window here. And this window shows you what's up in the sky for the date and the time that you set. So it'll show you stars and constellations and some deep sky objects, but also there's a representation of the Milky Way here on most planispheres. This is a cheap, you know, inexpensive $10 planisphere that we sell at Orion. Um, and like I said, just dial in the date and the time and it shows you what's up in the sky uh, for that time. And you can see in this particular depiction, the Milky Way is uh, the, 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 the core of the Milky Way, the, the, the bulging area is uh, sort of south, southwest a little bit at uh, you know, this particular uh, date and time. So that's one way to find it using a planisphere. Another way is there's plenty of um, astronomy software programs that you can get that um, allow you to do a lot of things. And one of them would be finding where the Milky Way is for any given date and time. This program is called Stellarium and I really like it. It's available as a desktop version, which is free. And also as a mobile version, which I think that might cost some like three bucks or something. It might cost something, but the desktop version is free and it's really good. You can just put in, you know, date and time and you know you can move the move the screen around to uh, to show you where the Milky Way is going to be. So that's another tool that I use. We'll go into more of that later about um, for um, planning Milky Way uh, nightscape shots. So the equipment you need is not fancy. I mean, it it can be a little bit fancier, but uh, basically a camera, a full frame, or a crop sensor camera is fine. Ideally, it's one with good dynamic range and that produces low noise at high ISOs. But, you know, use what you have, basically. Um, and you need a tripod with a ball head. As far as lenses go, um, wide is, is great. Um, 14 to 24 millimeters is what I would recommend. That, that would be for full frame. If you have a crop sensor camera, 24 millimeters is getting a little up there, but still doable. Just use, use what you have. If you have a kit lens, you know, um, that's fine. Um, you want fast F ratios. Um, F 2.8 is ideal. F 4, you can get away with even lower than F 2.8 uh, is good. If it's, if it's not too much distortion, which you, you sometimes get at these uh, low F stops. And manual lenses are fine. Um, you, you can't use, um, autofocus doesn't work well in the dark, go into that later. Um, so you're gonna focus manually. And so a manual lens is fine, setting the F-stop manually is fine. 
the Roke, for instance, a Rokinon 14 millimeter lens, f2.8, it's a completely manual lens, but it's really pretty inexpensive as far as lenses go. It's $329. And it's one of the best lenses you can get for nightscape photography. Um, other things that I use are a remote trigger, uh, a remote shutter release or an intervalometer. It's not necessary if your camera has, most cameras have a, uh, you know, a self timer type of thing where you can push the shutter and it, you know, it waits five seconds or two seconds or 10 seconds until it, it fires the, the, the shutter. Um, you just want to do that to avoid um, vibration from your hand um, when you're taking the shot. So I use an intervalometer, even though my camera does have a self timer. Um, a headlamp is good uh, for seeing what's going on. A bright LED flashlight I bring along, just especially if I have to hike out somewhere to get to where I'm setting up my composition. Um, and then other things like mosquito repellent or, or whatever. But that's about it. That's all you need. You can carry it all in a in a backpack. Um, here's my specific gear as I use for night shots: a, a Canon 6D, which has pretty good. It's pretty good as far as low noise at high ISOs. It's not not great, but it's it's good. I use this lens. This is my favorite lens. I use a number of lenses, but this is my favorite. It's a Tamron 15 to 30 millimeter f 2.8. And, um, and then an intervalometer here and a headlamp, a flashlight and a tripod um, with, a, with a ball head on it. So this is a Manfrotto tripod. <clears throat> this is some of what I use for nightscapes. So I just wanted to run through a few of the considerations that you need to keep in mind for Milky Way nightscape photography. One is to get to a dark, sky. So light pollution and even moonlight, if the moon is out, will wash out the Milky Way. Um, so as far as the moon goes, you've heard of new moon. That's the time when basically the moon is not illuminated. The side of the moon that we see is not illuminated. And um, five days on either side of new moon are really good because what there is of the moon is just a thin crescent. And usually, you know, it, it goes away um, at a certain time of night. Uh, even if it's out, it's not really gonna affect your shot very much. Um, so five days on either side of the new moon are good as far as that goes. Um, shoot in raw format, um, that's the best for post-processing and also if you shoot in JPEG, it's a, JPEG has some compression built in and that, that causes some noise. Um, so you wanna try to reduce the noise as much as possible. So just shoot in raw format. Um, focusing in the dark can be challenging. Um, we'll talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, like I said, autofocus doesn't work well in the dark. Now, if the moon is up, if, a, if there's a little bit of a crescent moon there, maybe the moon is setting or something, you can focus on the moon using autofocus. That usually works. But otherwise, there's other things we have to do to, to focus in the dark for nightscape photography. We'll talk about that. The big thing is that the sky moves. The stars are moving from east to west across the sky, just like the sun and moon do. And that's gonna limit the exposure time that um, you can have before the stars will start to smear, before they start to trail. You want sharp stars, pinpoint stars, but there's only a certain exposure length that you're going to be able to do before you're gonna get trailing. It depends on the focal length and some other factors, but um, we'll talk about that foreground illumination. You've got this nice foreground that you've, that you've, uh, you've composed for your, for your nightscape, but how are you going to illuminate it? It doesn't even need to be illuminated. I mean, silhouettes are nice, um, but we can talk a little bit about foreground illumination. I, Jeff said you've already uh, learned a little bit about light painting and you've covered that. That's one technique for illuminating an immediate foreground. So we'll talk about that. 
And the images are often noisy <clears throat> because um, you know, you're shooting in low light and oftentimes at high ISOs to maximize the, uh, the exposure. Um, so how do you suppress the noise? How do you keep noise out of your, or get noise out of your images? We'll talk about that. You probably know a lot about that already, but. And then lastly, who, me, scared of the d -d 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 dark? Um, I'm, a, I'm a freaky cat when it comes to uh, being out at night by myself in some remote area, um, but that's probably a good thing because it um, keeps you on your toes and you, you need to think about how to be safe. And one way would be to go out with somebody else and, and do this. I don't know a lot of people who do this right now, although there's one guy in a camera club I'm in up here who's expressed interest in, in doing some nightscape photography. So maybe I'll be able to buddy up uh, with him this, uh, this summer once we all get vaccinated and all that. Uh, but anyway, safety is, a, is an issue, so you need to be cognizant of it. Uh, I mentioned light painting and foreground illumination. I just wanted to show this example. This is taken at Davenport, California. Um, I wanted to shoot the Milky Way directly over this, uh, this sea stack here. And I guess my plan was that it was just going to be kind of a silhouette shot, but there were a bunch of people running around on the beach uh, this particular evening with flashlights, um, which much to my consternation, but uh, anyway, when I was shooting um, this, somebody actually had a flashlight, a pretty bright one, and shined it right on the sea stack. And it actually turned out pretty nice. I couldn't have done it better myself. Um, it's lit up pretty nicely and you got the Milky Way there. So this worked out. And um, I don't even remember if I was planning to light it up myself with a flashlight, but this guy did it for me and it worked out. So. Uh, that's one way to get your foreground object or foreground object, object. flashlight and somebody did that for me. Okay, optimal camera okay, setting. Optimal camera so as I mentioned, um, as, I mentioned um, as far as the lens focal length, go wide, um, as wide as you can, really. 14 millimeters to 24 millimeters is ideal for a lens. Um, aperture, um, as wide as your lens can handle. If it's 4.8 to whatever the widest setting is, at least start there. Sometimes you get some distortion, star distortion, especially around the edges of the frame, but it's a good place to start, wide open, see how it does. You can always stop it down if you need to, to get uh, better image quality. ISO, um, ideally 1600 to 6400, maybe even higher than that, depending on if your camera can handle that. Um, it really varies by camera, what your camera can do. The, the 6D that I have, the optimal uh, ISO is 6,400. Even lower ISOs produce more noise in the 6D. 3,200 is not as good as 6,400. I have another camera, it's a Fujifilm camera, and 1,600 is pretty much as high as you can go before you start getting all kinds of crazy noise. So it depends on your camera, but, you know, try different settings start at 1600 maybe go higher and see how see how it does shutter speed i mentioned it depends on the focal length because everything's moving in the sky um so there's a a rule i don't know if you guys have talked about it yet or not in the class probably not um, but it's called the 500 yeah. rule and it's it's not perfect but it's a good place to start as far as uh, determining how long you can go before you're going to start seeing star trailing. And obviously you want as much light as possible for your nightscape. Um, so you want to go as long as you can before you start seeing considerable star trailing. Um, so here's what I mean by star trailing. Here's a shot that's just too long of an exposure um, for this particular uh, lens and you, you see the stars are all streaked and look, look bad. What you want is nice pinpoint stars like this. So the 500 rule, what is it? Well, it's pretty simple. You take 500 and you divide it by the focal length. Um, and if you have a full frame camera, it's just 500 divided by the focal length. 
if you have a crop sensor camera, there's a, a crop factor like for the Canon 6D, I'm sorry, for, uh, for Canon crop sensor cameras, um, it's 1.6. I think Nikon is usually 1.5 or something. But anyway, that's the formula, pretty simple. So for instance, for a 24 millimeter lens on a full frame camera, it's 500 divided by 24. That's 20.8, which is about 20 seconds. So any exposure, I uh, forgot to correct this. This is, oops, how do I go back? Um, this is a mistake here. This should be 20 seconds. Any exposure up to 20 seconds will produce reasonably sharp stars and longer exposures will result in noticeable star trailing. Um, so it's approximate. I mean, you can still, if you pixel peep and you really zoom in, you'll be able to see a teeny bit of star trailing, a star elongation at 20 seconds, but it's not bad when you're just looking at the shot, um, you know, on a normal screen or in a normal size photograph, uh, you're not gonna see any appreciable star trailing. Um, if you have a 14 millimeter lens and it's on a crop sensor camera, you would take 500 divided by 14 times 1.6 if it's a Canon camera. And that's 500 divided by 22.4 equals 22. Point, uh, not sure what that is. Um, yeah, equals 22.3 or approximately 22 seconds. Now, some cameras can't do 22 seconds. Mine can't although I can set it on the intervalometer for 22 seconds, but on the camera itself, it'll do like 20 seconds or 25. You can't do 22. So I would just cut it down to 20 then. Um, but anyway, that's the 500 rule. And you can see here for various focal lengths, as you increase the focal length, you're gonna decrease your exposure time. So that at like with a 50 millimeter lens, you're only gonna be able to get 10 seconds on a full frame camera uh, before you're going to start seeing some star elongation. So that's the 500 rule, and it's not perfect. There are other formulas um, that take in, into account other factors, such as the declination of the, of the sky where you're shooting, um, because at zero declination, the trailing is going to be the most pronounced. They take into account that and the size of your of your sensor and so forth and so on. Uh, the resolution of your sensor, that is, uh, number of megapixels. Uh, they take those things into account and they come up with uh, numbers that are a little bit more accurate, let's say, than, than this. But this is good enough to start out. This is what I always used um, for a number of years before I started using other formulas. So we'll just stick with the 500 rule. So here's a shot that was taken with a Sony A7S, which is a, a night photography beast because the pixels are, are nine uh, microns across, which is pretty big compared to most cameras. So it's taken with a 14 millimeter lens, f2.8. And I used ISO 12,800 because I can on this camera. Um, it's it's uh, it's just such a, a low light beast that you can do that with it with an ace with the a7s and it's 25 seconds and you can see it's pretty well you know pretty the milky way is pretty well exposed and uh the stars look sharp and it's within the 500 rule and so that's what i use there let's talk about focusing for nightscapes because as i said autofocus is not going to work well in the darkness so you're going to have to focus manually I never rely on that infinity mark on your lens because it's not very precise and it's not gonna be accurate enough. Um, so I don't trust that and I don't use that. Um, the way I focus uh, and the way that's commonly used to focus for nightscapes is to use live view if your camera has that. And you can usually magnify the image on the screen up to about 10 times. Some it varies depending on the camera, but mine goes up to, to 10X. And so you take a star, a bright star, or if the moon's out, that's great, or a planet, or even some distant light source that's like a quarter mile away or greater than 100 feet away. 
and you put it on your your live view and you um, and you focus on it and that works pretty well. Um, you can use a, a light source, as I said, a street lamp or something that's far away um, to do your focusing. But oftentimes it's a star that we end up having to use and you manually focus the you know, the, the focus ring back and forth until the star is the tightest. If your camera doesn't have live view, there's a couple of things you can do. You can focus when it is light out, maybe like at twilight or something before darkness has really set in and get your sort of infinity focus and then leave it there and, uh, and just use that as your focus for your, uh, for your nightscape. Another way to do it would be trial and error. You, you focus, you take a shot, and you review it on your LCD screen. And if it doesn't look really sharp when you're zooming in, um, tweak the focus a little bit, shoot another shot, review it. And you keep doing that until you, until you get to that, um, that sweet spot of focus. So that's another way to do it. Here's a, uh, a little video clip. Uh, yeah, it starts out with some weird noise in the, I'm not sure where that came from, but anyway, this is a video clip. It's not mine, but it shows um, focusing. I click the thing. Okay, is this live? Uh, how do I get this to work? Ah. Let's try this again. See if this goes. So this is the view. Here we are. This is the view of your LCD screen. This is at 10x. There's a star. It's out of focus. You turn the focus wheel. The star gets tighter and tighter. Now I pass the focus point. I'm going back and it's getting bigger again. So I turn it the other way and you just keep doing that, turning the, the focus uh, wheel back and forth until you get the star to be as sharp as you can. Another trick is, let's say this is a pretty bright star. There's fainter stars in the field of view, most likely. And sometimes they're not even visible until you hit that exact focus point and they pop into view. And when that happens, you know you're in focus when these little faint stars that you can't even see when you're out of focus, when you're in focus, they appear on the screen and then you know you're, you've hit that, that focus point. So that's how you focus on a star at night. It's not really that difficult, it takes a little, little getting used to maybe, but that's how you focus uh, at night. Okay. We're going to talk about composition planning for a minute. And I threw in this, this quote because it's one of my favorite quotes, and it's really exactly spot on for me. Uh, the camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. And I don't know about you all, but now that I've sort of gotten into photography in the last five years or so, um, that's exactly what happens with me is I'm, you know, walking around or driving around and I see a composition and I kind of just think about how that's going to look uh, framed up in the camera. And um, it's, it's absolutely true for me and maybe it is for you too, but it's, it's kind of a cool quote. It's one of my favorites. And I thought I'd throw it in there when we start to talk about composition planning. So for Milky Way nightscapes, you want to look for some kind of interesting foreground. I mean, ideally, uh, just a landscape that's cool, or some kind of object or structure. Maybe there's a, you know, a windmill or a, a barn, you know, an old barn or something that you want to get juxtaposed with the Milky Way in the background. Something like that 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 has some level of interest as a foreground to complement the Mil Milky Way in the background. And then you're gonna to wanna to scout out your location when it's still light um, to, uh, you know, you don't wanna approach some place where you've never been in the, you know, when it's dark. So you wanna scout it out when it's light and get your kind of foreground composition, get that set. Um, but you need to know where the Milky Way is gonna be, right? And so uh, we talked about the planisphere or using software um, to get the general direction. Is it going to be in the south? You know, what time and all that. But there are apps that can really help with planning for aligning the, the foreground elements with the Milky Way and the best time to shoot, you know, um, 
you know, when is the Milky Way going to be where you need it to be in your composition? So there's apps that you can use to, uh, to help. And we'll talk about that. This is a shot I took um, here in central Oregon of the Milky Way. I wanted to get Mount Bachelor in, and this is a lake, a small lake called Todd Lake. And I used an app to help me kind of line all this up, or at least I, I knew that the Milky Way would rise over Mount Bachelor at a certain time of year, you know, uh, and uh, I knew if I climbed up on this, uh, this hill, I could get Todd Lake in the picture as well. And it's just a matter of, you know, planning the right day, date and time so that I could get the alignment that I wanted in the picture. And uh, I used an app to help me do that. And this is actually a two image blend, which oftentimes you have to do because um, you're not going to get enough foreground illumination in a, a 30 second shot, or in this case, a 20 second shot to, uh, to light up the foreground very much. So how do you do that? Well, once is you take your sky shot, you know, your 20 second shot, this was with a nine, at 19 millimeters F2.8 ISO 6400. Um, and then you take a second shot of the foreground. In this case, it was, uh, you know, four minutes long at ISO 2000 F3.5. And that longer exposure just, you know, helps illuminate the, uh, the foreground. And then you blend those together in Photoshop. And it's, it can be a little tricky doing that. This wasn't too tricky because the, the, there wasn't any like trees sticking up with intricate branches or anything. Um, and there's ways to blend shots in Photoshop or other programs uh, that uh, make it relatively, uh, well, not, not too difficult. So, uh, so this is a two shot blend so I could get uh, the foreground illuminated like I wanted. Here's another shot, uh, just in terms of composition planning that I didn't really have a, much of a plan for this shot. I went out to a, a butte it's about 20 minutes from home here. And um, it's in a forested area. And uh, I knew that there were gonna be trees and I knew that I could get up a little high if I needed to on this butte. Um, but when I got out there, um, I sort of looked, scouted around and I saw these, uh, these trees here and they it kind of looked pretty cool uh, having the Milky Way arch up above these trees here. It's very simple but sometimes those are the most impactful shots. And um, so I just, you know, position myself where the, uh, the Milky Way would arch up over these, uh, these trees here sticking up above the horizon. I, you know, I think it look, looks kind of cool. And that wasn't really planned much in advance, but it was sort of planned when I got out there. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can get really good shots without a tremendous amount of planning, as long as, uh, like I said, you kind of get out there before it gets too dark to sort of scope things out. Um, here's a shot I wanted to add. I added this, uh, I just wanted to mention, this is out at, um, in Big Sur, and it, there's a, a waterfall called McWay Falls. And it's a, it's a small but tall waterfall that, that, um, that dumps the water right onto a beach in this little cove called uh, McWay Falls or McWay Cove, I guess it is. And it's really scenic. And every photographer, night photographer and their brother goes out and shoots uh, at McWay Falls. And so I went out there one night uh, to shoot it and I'm, I get all set up and I've got my composition, I'm ready to go. And these two, uh, you know, ranger guys come up and they say, you can't shoot here. And I was flabbergasted, I said, what? And uh, they said, no, you, you can't, you're not allowed to be out here after dark. And I don't recall seeing a sign or anything about that. And I said, well, you know, you go on the internet and punch in Milky Way or uh, McWay Falls Milky Way, and you're going to get about 5,000 photographs that come up. You know, I was trying to point out that everyone shoots here at night. And they said, well, it didn't matter. You're not allowed to do it. So they, they uh, hustled me out of there. And so I was super pissed and I'm driving home and it, it takes, you know, from where I was living in Santa Cruz to get down there, you know, what is it, an hour and a half, a couple hours or something like that. It's, 
it's uh, you know, it's it's a commitment to, to go down there to shoot. And now I've got to leave with nothing. And I was super pissed. So I'm driving, driving out of the area, and I look to my left, and this is what I saw. I saw these trees sticking up above the horizon. I saw the Milky Way, and this is not the sun. This is actually a thin crescent moon, but because this is a 26 second exposure, it's blown out and it looks, um, you know, it looks like a big, you know, it looks like the sun is setting or something, but it's the moon. And I looked at that and I immediately saw this comp, that's like that Dorothea Lange quote, right? Um, I immediately saw a composition for a photograph and I pulled over and I got out and I, I photographed it and I could have taken a second shot where I got the crescent moon. It was a very thin crescent and then somehow blended them together. But I really liked this, the glow, the moon cast on the water at this, you know, this 20 second, 26 second exposure. I really liked it. So here's a case. It was a composition that I wasn't planning at all, but I was glad that I got something for my effort of going all the way down there, uh, having been kicked out of McWay Falls. So again, um, sometimes it's a composition you don't expect, but you see it. And this happened to work out pretty well. I really like, you can't often get the moon and the Milky Way in the same shot because the moon is too overpowering, but this was such a thin crescent that it actually worked and it created this interesting effect. Um, so there it is. Um, here's another shot in terms of planning that I plan. This is a river, right? About 10 minutes from my house, the Deschutes River. And I wanted to get the Milky Way sort of aligned with the river. So I used apps to, um, to do that, to figure that out. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about these apps. These are my favorites. TPE, the Photographer's Ephemeris. Uh, there's a desktop version and a mobile version. The desktop version is great for, for looking, for planning like sunsets, like where's the sun gonna rise or set? Where's the moon gonna rise and set? At what times? They're super powerful uh apps uh, but the desktop version doesn't have any uh sort of night milky way uh, capability milky way planning capability but the but the mobile version does and i'll show you that in a minute um and all these apps cost something except for google earth all these apps cost something i don't remember the 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 prices of them but uh anyway tpe is really good Planet Pro is one I've been starting to use recently, and it's super powerful too. It's just got so much, so many tools for planning shots in the daytime or at night, and it's got this Milky Way uh, 3D kind of a thing, um, just like T TPE mobile version does that allows you to plan Milky Way shots. So that that's a really good program. Photo Pills is excellent, super powerful, lots of things you can do with it. One of the clever features that it has is called Night Augmented Reality. And I'll show you that in a minute. But Photo, Photo Pills is a great, very powerful uh, tool. And then I use Google Earth for um, just uh, planning, you know, looking at the geography of where I wanna go and, and, and all that. Um, that's super helpful as well. So here's an example of the TPE's mobile version. So this is a pond called Reynolds Pond and it's out here it's about a half hour from where I live. And I had never been out there. So I sort of scoped it out using a uh, TPE. And what you do is you put a marker down and it tells you where the sun is gonna rise relative to that viewpoint. So in this case, it's gonna rise over, over here. It tells you where it's gonna set. So this orange, this darker orange line tells you where the sun's gonna be when it sets. Here's the moon, it's gonna rise over here. And here's where it's gonna set from this direction relative to my pinpoint there. And then you can move the time slider. You can move, slide it backwards or forwards. And these little bars here show you where the sun and the moon will be at that time. So it's really great for planning. And it tells you what time is sunrise and sunset and moonrise and moonset and how big the moon's gonna be uh, 2.1% waning moon, this and that. Lots of detail here. You can set up all your locations for all your favorite places to go and so forth. And um, so for night photography, for Milky Way, it gives you this 3D kind of representation of the Milky Way. 
And where these like large balls are, that's the core of the Milky Way right there, that large ball there. So I knew that if I went out on this particular date, March 11th, 2021, uh, and I set up right here on this, on the left side of the lake, that the Milky Way core at, what time are we talking about? Oh, that's, oh, that's the current time. At 4.15 a.m. was going to be right here to, to my right. Um, and then the Milky Way was going to be arching over the pond, right over the pond. So that sounded good to me. Um, so I did it. I went out there, about, got out there about 3 a.m., you know, scouted around a little bit. And uh, I had been out there before during the day and taken some shots and just to get a, the lay of the land of the lake. And it's great, um, or the pond rather. So here's a shot I took um, from where that marker was, um, looking over uh, to my right. And here's the core of the Milky Way, which is uh, the brightest part of the Milky Way. And, uh, you know, I got the reflection and there was some mist on the pond and there's, there's some little islands on the pond that have like trees or shrubbery on them. And it's just very scenic out there. So this is a, at 30 millimeters using my 15 to 30 millimeter lens at F2.8 and ISO 6400. I'm using the Canon 6D and it handles 6400 really well. And this is a 20 second shot. Uh, this is probably a little bit longer than recommended by the 500 rule, or I don't know, maybe it's, it's probably right in there, around, around the correct. If you zoom in on this, you can see the stars are starting to elongate, but when you're looking at the picture as a whole, you can't really tell that. The stars look pretty sharp there. So uh, anyway, that was the shot, and here's a panorama I took. So I mentioned that the Milky Way was going to arch. That app showed that it's arching right over the lake. So I was standing right there on the left side of the lake and I took a sequence of how many shots? Nine at 15 millimeters at 3.5 and 20 second shots. And I stitched them together in Lightroom, which takes about 30 seconds to do that. You just take all your shots in, in Lightroom and there's other programs that do this well. There, there's one called ICE, which is, uh, I can't remember what the ICE stands for, I-C-E, it's an acronym image composite, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's a Microsoft program and it's free, I believe. And that stitches together panoramas very nicely as well. Uh, so here's a shot uh, of the Milky Way arching over Reynolds Pond. All right, I mentioned that PhotoPills has this night augmented reality feature. And what you do is you, it accesses your camera. So you push the button, and you see a live view through your phone's camera. And then on that, it superimposes this sort of night sky um, grid. And then you can slot, just using your finger on your phone, you slide time backwards or forwards, and it shows you, you know, where the Milky Way is gonna be, it shows you where the moon's gonna be, when the sun's gonna go down, whatever. Um, it's, so it's a great planning tool when you're at a location you can see where you want to be. If I wanted to line up the Milky Way, like between these two trees here, um, I, you know, I, I aim my camera at the trees and it's on the screen. And then you, you slide your finger back and forth and it shows you where the Milky Way is going to be. And then you can, you know, adjust your position. If you want the core of the Milky Way to be right in between these two trees or, you know, wherever, but it's super powerful in that way, as long as you're out at the site. So you're out there in the daytime, you wanna know where the Milky Way is gonna be. This photo pills with this night augmented reality is a really cool feature. Um, and again, like for moonset or moonrise or something, you can do the same thing. This orange dot here, by the way, is the core of the Milky Way. That's a representation of the core of the Milky Way. So that's showing where it would be you know, at this particular time, 1042 on July 9th, 2019. Anyway, cool feature in photo pills. So let's talk a little bit about noise because noise really is the bane of nightscapers. Um, and you're always trying to combat it because you're shooting in low light and usually at high ISOs to maximize the amount of light input. So here's a shot, super distorted. I was using a 14 millimeter lens, it has a lot of distortion. Um, but here's a shot out at Smith Rock State Park 
and um, you know, when you zoom in, uh, you can see the noise. It looks like sandpaper, right? It's just, it's just like this texture throughout the image, and it bugs me. And it can, you know, it can, it can uh, sort of smear out fine details uh, if it gets out of hand. So in photography, you don't hear noise; you see it, right? Um, and as you probably know, noise is electronic static that appears as graininess, and it obscures fine details. And it's caused by these aberrant pixels that that don't accurately represent the color or the brightness of the scene. So we want to minimize those. And there's different types of digital noise. I don't know how much you've gotten into this. I don't understand all of it, but um, I know that there's fixed pattern noise, which shows up as hot pixels. And those are will be sort of in the same place on every shot you take. You'll have these hot pixels. And they're a pain if there's a lot of them. You got to either, you know, you got to get them out of there. And uh, there's ways to do that, but um, they're not good. The random noise is the one, the noise that we'll focus on here. And that's different in each shot. And you can, there are techniques for getting rid of it. Um, that are more or less effective. There's color noise, which is a problem, especially if you're trying to bring up dark, bring up shadow areas, you know, you can, you start getting into all this color noise and then you, there's cut, there's banding. Um, so it's all bad. You, you, you want to minimize it and it's caused, well, there's noise in every picture, even in daytime pictures and all that, as you know. Um, but usually what you want is more signal, uh, than noise, uh, to a, a, a great degree, the, the higher the signal to noise, the less the noise is going to be the problem. But at night, you're shooting at high ISOs and it's low light, and the, the, the signal to noise ratio is low. And so you got to deal with it. You got to deal with the noise. So here's some strategies. First of all, as I mentioned before, shoot in raw because JPEG uses compression, which introduces some noise. And in raw mode, you're going to have more options for in post-processing for bringing up shadows and things like that effectively. So shoot in RAW. Another thing for foreground in your, your nightscapes for shooting the foreground, one technique is to shoot it during twilight, the so-called blue hour, um, when there's still some ambient light out. Uh, because then you're going to get better illumination, you're going to get lower noise, and then you combine that with a separate sky shot, as I showed in that other photo of the Mount Patchett with the lake, combine that with a separate sky shot in Photoshop or GIMP or whatever program you're using. Um, so a lot of people do that. And if you do it well and you process it well, it'll work. You don't want it to look like it's a daytime shot with a night sky pasted in the background. That's what you don't want. So you have to you have to uh, be a little subtle about it. But anyway, that's a, that's a good technique. And then, as I mentioned, um, as I showed in that other photo, you shoot two exposures, both of them are at night. So you shoot one for the sky, adhering to the 500 rule, so you get sharp stars. And then you shoot a much longer exposure for the foreground. That other one that I showed was four minutes exposure. And then you combine them in Photoshop. And that long exposure will be, will be fairly, um, will have fairly minimal noise, right? And, um, and so that's another way to do it and um, combining two images. It takes a little bit of skill to do that combining, but it's something you can learn. Um, another technique that is commonly used today more and more is image stacking. So you're digitally combining multiple images. So you take 12 images of the same scene, one after the other and then you combine them. And what's gonna happen um, is, um, how do I say this? If you combine 12 night images and each one was shot, let's say, let's say you had 12 20 second shots using a 24 millimeter lens or something. And you combine all those, if you align them so that the stars um, are stacked, so that the stars look sharp, then the ground is gonna be smeared, right? Because remember the sky is moving through all those exposures. If you combine it so the, if you uh, align them so that the foreground is aligned, then the stars are gonna be smeared. You're effect effectively taking a star trail shot. Um, 
because you've just got, you know, you've got a total of, let's say, uh, you know, two or three minutes or four minutes of exposures, well, the stars are going to smear during that time. So how do you do that? How do you combine it so the stars are sharp and the landscape is sharp? Well, there's programs that do that automatically now, and they are a godsend. So one for Windows is called Sequator, and it's free. And the one for Mac is called Starry Landscape Stacker, and they basically do the same thing. What they allow you to do is to take 12 images and stack them and you can freeze the ground. So it will, it will align the ground images and it will align the sky images separately and then it will combine them. So you don't have to do this, comp, this combining in Photoshop. It does it automatically and it's really great. The results are really fantastic and it's so easy to do. So that's, that's really, I, had, I didn't even discover this until like within the last year. And it's really making a difference in how I can uh, process these nightscape images. So those are two programs worth looking into if you want to get into nightscape. And then another way to suppress noise is to, um, you know, do it in post-processing using programs that sort of specialize in noise suppression, noise reduction. I use this Topaz Denoise. I think now it's Topaz Denoise AI and there's Noise Ninja and all these other ones. Um, and they are very good at suppressing noise and while maintaining detail. Because if you suppress noise too much, it's gonna smooth out the, the detail that you want and just make everything look fake. They make everything look artificial. It's just no good. Uh, Photoshop and Lightroom have noise reduction capabilities, um, but they're not as good as these, these specialized programs. Uh, but they're good enough. If, if that's all you have, um, or even some other programs, I'm sure have uh, has, have noise reduction. Use that, and you know, uh, it's better than better than nothing. So here's an example with a single exposure at 6400, and you can see the sort of black graininess in here. And here's a stack of 12 exposures, and it's just clean that right up, and. Uh, so that's what you can, that's what you, that's what you're shooting for. Here's an image I took. It's not a Milky Way nightscape, but it's a nightscape nonetheless. This was Comet Neowise out at a lake. And um, it's just, it's just full of noise. There's just, you can't, in the sky, the sky's not too bad, but the foreground, you can really notice it in these shadow areas. And um, so, but here's, so here's a single image zoomed in a little bit. And then I just took a stack of 18 images and you don't really need to take that many, uh, even five or six images will help, but I did 18 for some reason. And uh, it just cleans up that noise really well. So that's the power of image stacking. It really gets rid of noise. This is a shot again, another one taken out at the lake. This was a combination of just five images combined in that program called Sequator. And the way that works in Sequator is you, you put your five images in and it, uh, it takes one of them as your reference image. And then there's a, there's a tool that you just smear across any part of the sky, any part of the image that is sky, that is stars. So you, you select this whole area. And I even did it down here too, because there's stars down here. So I selected this area and that area with this tool and that's it. it. And then you hit the button and it does it. And you hit the thing that says freeze ground and you hit the button and it does everything for you. And it stacked this image and it made the stars sharp and the land is sharp. Everything is good. And that's the beauty of stacking. So that's about all I have. Um, this is a shot that I did just for fun when the comet was out. I wanted to get the comet and the Milky Way in the same shot. And unfortunately, you know, the comet was in a different part of the sky. So I did a pano of 12 frames. I think this is cropped in a little bit, but 12 frames where I just take a shot move in portrait orientation, move the camera 20 degrees or so, take another shot, move it. And um, until I covered, you know, half the sky or more and uh, stitched in Lightroom, which is very easy to do. This is in a lava field near where I live. It's all lava rock, uh, except for some plants that are surviving in that harsh environment. And this is a butte and it's illuminated uh, sort of 
in a cool way because the city of Bend is right behind it from this orientation. So it kind of lights up this, uh, this view, highlights it in an interesting way. Um, so anyway, um, that's all I wanted to talk about. And Jeff asked me if you know there were some exercises that I could suggest for you guys to, uh, you know, to try this stuff out. So I thought of these three. And one is to download the program Stellarium, which is free, and just start messing with it. Um, practice finding the Milky Way in different months or season, times of night. And notice how it moves from hour to hour during the night. Um, it starts out low, like right now, you get up at, in the wee hours of the morning and it's kind of low arching thing. And then as the hours progress, it, it starts standing up higher and higher until, you know, until it gets light and you, you can't see it anymore. But um, that's a good, that would be a good thing to, to try because that program would probably come in useful for your planning. Another is to shoot the sky. It doesn't have to be the Milky Way, but a starry sky with your lens wide open. Um, and then stop down a, a stop or two and compare the images and look particularly around the edges. And you probably notice the sharpness of the stars at the edges is better when the aperture is stopped down. And that's great, except the more you stop it down, of course, the less light you're letting in. And at night, light is critical. So you want to achieve some balance where the stars are acceptable around the edge. Um, you're not stopping down too much and you're still getting enough light in. So, uh, so try that. Maybe you just set the ISO to 1600 to start out or whatever. And just look at the effect of aperture on image quality around the edge. And then the third would be to take exposures at three different shutter speeds. I'm suggesting 10 seconds, 25 and 40. And then Pull them up on your computer and zoom in on them and look for star trailing. You know, you'll, you'll probably see little or no star trailing at 10 seconds and you'll start seeing it at 25 and it'll probably be pretty obvious at 40. And then for your uh, particular lens, for your focal length, what is the 500 rule? What does the 500 rule say your maximum exposure can be? And how does that compare to what, are, what these numbers? So that's just uh, an exercise to get you thinking about the 500 rule and exposure length um, for nightscape photography. And that's it. That's all I wanted to, to talk about today. Hopefully um, some of you who haven't tried it can go out and uh, with your the equipment that you have and take a few shots of the Milky Way. It's still, you gotta stay up pretty early in the morning to, uh, to, to see it now, but once you hit, um, you know, May, June, July, it's, uh, the Milky Way will be visible, you know, right when it gets dark, so you won't have to stay up very late anyway. And then, you know, it might be a little more uh, accessible then, but now's the time to start thinking about it because the Milky Way is up, the core of the Milky Way is above the horizon in the wee hours of the morning and it's coming. So it'll be a good opportunity to get set for some, uh, Milky Way photography uh, this summer. That's it. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, why don't you uh, yeah, pull out of share screen. Okay. Um, so um, we've we got some really great tips uh, here. And also uh, the beauty of it is that we don't need um, real expensive equipment. We're just going to be using, uh, I'm going to uh, stop the recording, by the way. Let's see if I can do that. Um, here we go. Can I ask a question? Sure. 